All right, we are now recording and um, well, we're going to start with uh, actually the same uh, view of the city that I always start my tours with. But uh, the reason I'm doing this is to give you an overview of the city map and give you an idea of what part of the city we are going to see today. So we are now, what you see right in front of you is downtown St. Petersburg, right? And you and I have spent a lot of time here virtually or in real life. Um, but today I will be showing you mostly two parts of the city that are a little bit different. The first one is this island right here. Uh, this island is called, called Vasilyevsky Island, or also known as Basil's Island. And this is, um, this island, a big part of it has the oldest part of St. Petersburg. Another big part of it has one of the newest parts of St. Petersburg. So uh, the first part with the oldest one is right here. We call this the spit of Basil's Island. As you can see, it separates our main river into two parts right here. And so back in the early 18th century, when Peter the Great founded our city, um, all the earliest historic buildings, they were located on two sides of the river. So of course, um, the royal residence, a lot of it was here, but a lot of people, they lived on the island. And um, the island was planned really meticulously. Uh, Peter the Great, uh, he believed in order. And the map of the original Basil's Island reminds me, when I look at it, reminds me of the modern map of Manhattan because it had three avenues. It had the big, the medium, and the small avenues. And then all the streets were numbered. There was first street, second street, third, and so on. So normally um, when they talk about, you know, where um, on Basil's Island something is, they say, oh, it's third and big, or, oh, it's sixth and medium, and so on, which really reminds me of New York. Um, and on the shore of this uh, river right here, um, there are a lot of original 18th century buildings. We're going to be seeing a lot of them today. O on the other hand, a big part of Basil's Island, which is in the back, got built up really recently. Uh, the first apartment buildings uh, appeared there in mid 20th century. And one of the latest addition to that part of the island was a big cruise ship port. So if you ever plan to visit St. Petersburg by cruise, your ship will probably be docked over there on the other side of the island. And so um, we're going to start with, um, with one of the um, newest additions uh, to the island. Um, I love taking everybody to art museums, as you know. Um, but one museum that I haven't shown yet is our Museum of Russian Contemporary Art. So at the very end of, the, uh, uh, of Basil's Island, we have this wonderful modern art gallery uh, that is called Era Arta. Um, it's a combination of two words, era and art. Um, and um, the mission of Era Arta was to become the most representative art gallery of modern Russian art. So their mission is to um, try to find artists from all over the country, not just local artists from St. Petersburg, not just the artists that the owners of the gallery objective, uh, subjectively like, but actually get a nice idea of what modern art in Russia is like. And they believe that modern art um, in Russia starts with maybe mid 20th century. So they have some really um, political pieces that criticize current government. Or at the same time, they have works of contemporary artists um, who just are beautiful, um, who, which are just beautiful. And uh, this is what you can see here. This hall is dedicated to 
one of the most famous um, mod, uh, contemporary Russian artists. His name is Dmitry Shorin. And um, his style, he's really famous for uh, creating paintings uh, that combine beautiful girls and airplanes. So as you can see, um, a lot of his works are like this. We have some beautiful girls and airplanes or helicopters, drones, and so on. Um, Dmitry Shorin is um, a wonderful local artist and he lives in St. Petersburg. And um, he was the youngest artist to ever have a personalized exhibit in um, the Russian Museum. So the Russian Museum is our main Russian art museum in St. Petersburg. By the way, I am planning on taking you there virtually also in August. Um, but he was the youngest artist to ever get a personalized exhibit there. And uh, what made Dmitry Shorin especially famous what were his statues? You can see one statue right here. Um, and uh, he created a lot more of these statues. They would look like um, girls, statues of girls, and they would have airplane wings. And um, these statues were placed in our local airport. So when, if you ever do visit St. Petersburg in real life, and you fly into our airport, uh, keep an eye out because uh, Dmitry Shorin's beautiful sculptures are all over the airport and they're really beautiful. So it just worked out perfectly. Um, beautiful girls, airplanes, you know, that just was perfect for our airport. And um, he's now one of the most famous artists um, in St. Petersburg. All right. On the other hand, uh, St. Basil's Island also have also has uh, beautiful 18th century buildings like this. Um, what you see right in front of you is the Cathedral of St. Andrew. Um, in Russia, St. Andrew is a patron saint of our Navy. And as you already know, when St. Petersburg was founded, um, it was really important uh, for Peter the Great to make this the place, uh, which is the birthplace of the Russian Navy. So uh, St. Andrew is really well regarded in St. Petersburg. And of course, we had to have a monastery dedicated, sorry, a church dedicated to St. Andrew in our, uh, one of our most historic parts. Uh, here you can also see a beautiful pedestrian street, um, which is all the streets dedicated to restaurants. This is, by the way, 6th and Medium Avenue. <laughs> um, and uh, as you go further, you will see there are uh, restaurants here just everywhere. It's a wonderful uh, place to have a meal. As this view was taken in the summer, um, you can see that lots of restaurants on the street, they have um, summer terraces and um, street musicians. So um, this, is, this is one of the most favorite places for locals to hang out. Um, if we turn around, which is what I'm gonna do right now, all the way down, if we keep going, we will eventually find ourselves on the shore of the Neva River, which is our, you know, our main river. We can see some beautiful 18th century architecture here. Um, old historic buildings here um, are combined with more modern architecture because these are all apartment buildings. People actually live here. And eventually we can find ourselves, as I said, right on the shore um, of the Neva River. Here we are. So downtown St. Petersburg is on the other side of the river. Behind us is this gorgeous building of the Academy of Fine Arts. So this is an 18th century building again. That was, uh, this was founded by Empress Elizabeth, the daughter of Peter the Great. And on the other side of the Academy, 
we have these two beautiful matching sphinxes. One and two. And these are real Egyptian sphinxes that were purchased by the Academy of Fine Arts in the first half of the 19th century. Um, you know, you might know this from my tours or just visiting pretty much um, any art museum in Europe. You might have heard that the 19th century was the time um, where um, everybody in Europe was absolutely interested in um, antiquities. It was all about excavations and ancient Greek, ancient Roman culture was really popular, but also was the Egyptian culture. Some excavations took place um, in Egypt and um, a Russian Egyptologist went there, saw the beautiful sphinxes and realized that we had to have something like this in St. Petersburg. While he was trying to purchase the sphinxes, he was writing to the Tsar. He was writing to the administration of St. Petersburg. He was finally writing to the director of the Academy of Fine Arts, which finally, this was the um, organization that wanted to buy the sphinxes after all. Um, the sphinxes were actually purchased by the French government, uh, but uh, they had uh, some political instability that year and they ended up not following through with the purchase, not buying the sphinxes. So they did go to Russia finally. So um, as these sphinxes are located right next to the Academy of Fine Arts, um, this is a really favorite place for local college students. It's believed that the sphinxes can bring you good luck, um, especially when exams are coming up. So um, in basically the whole month of June, you can see college students uh, hanging out around the sphinxes using all sorts of different rituals that they believe will bring them good luck during the exams. Um, some people believe you have to walk around the Sphinx several times. Some other people believe it's all about the time of day when you come there. Uh, you know, there is a group of people that think there is a certain thing you should drink next to the Sphinxes, um, an alcoholic drink, of course, and that should bring you good luck. Um, anyway, uh, you know, it must work because uh, some of these things have been believed in for centuries. Anyway, uh, we are going to keep going further down the embankment and I'll show you some other beautiful parts of this wonderful island. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the architecture in here is very different from even downtown St. Petersburg because these buildings are much, much older. Uh, and this is a good example of the early 18th century architecture in St. Petersburg. You can see, if you look at these windows, you can see uh, each window consists of six to eight pieces of glass. And that is because in the early 18th century, glass was expensive. Um, it was, if a piece of glass, if part of the window got broken, it would be much easier to replace one eighth of the window other than the whole window. And an even better example of it is this beautiful palace. Look how many little pieces of glass you can see in the windows here, right? So this beautiful palace with gorgeous crowns on top belonged to the richest man in St. Petersburg in the early 18th century, also known as the governor of St. Petersburg, Prince Alexander Menshikov. He was one of the best friends of Peter the Great. He um, accompanied Peter the Great to different military campaigns. And during the peaceful time, he was the one who um, was overseeing the construction of St. Petersburg. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this island was supposed to be the residential part of the city. So um, Peter the Great gave Prince Alexander Menshikov some funds and he said, um, I want you to build up this area. I want you to, um, you know, make sure it looks good as 
uh, in the new capital of the Russian Empire, uh, the shore of the river had to be presentable. So Alexander Menshikov took the money. He did build up uh, this part of the island, but instead of houses for other people, or maybe schools or hospitals, he occupied this part of the island with his own palace. And his palace was several times bigger than Peter the Great's own palace. Peter the Great lived in a small, um, uh, in a small one-story building, and you can see this is where Prince Alexander Menshikov lived. Um, <laughs> Uh, certain people say in their memoirs that when Peter the Great found out about it, um, he beat up Alexander Menshikov with his cane. So this is what punishment was would be like in the early 18th century in Russia. Um, of course, Peter the Great was mad about the corruption in the country. And he was saying to Alexander Menshikov that um, maybe he should be um, punishing the people who he catches, you know, that are corrupt, maybe putting them in jail or um, even executing them. But Prince Alexander Menshikov warned him. He said, you know, you'll be left with um, <laughs> uh, no government officials in your country. So Peter the Great changed his mind. And so that never happened. Prince Alexander Menshikov was the one who introduced Peter the Great to his second wife and the true love of his life. Uh, future Empress um, Catherine I. And finally, um, Menshikov lived longer than Peter the Great. He influenced his wife, who ruled after him. And he was trying to become um, actually related to the royal family. Um, at some point, um, he um, tried to marry his daughter with the grandson of um, Peter the Great. But it didn't work out. The whole family of Prince Alexander Menshikov got um, exiled to Siberia, where um, uh, they lived for the rest of their lives. And his palace was turned into a military school for boys. And pretty much it served as such um, until the um, late 20th century, where when the Hermitage Museum purchased the palace and um, made it the museum of um, Russian life in the 18th century. We're gonna go further up, see some more gorgeous buildings. On your left hand side right now, uh, you see uh, the buildings of St. Pet uh, Petersburg State University. In this particular building is where I went to college, so these are the departments of linguistics and oriental studies. And further up uh, uh, in this building, we have the Department of Biology, Chemistry. Um, deeper down the island, we have the Department of Philosophy and History. Um, and as we keep going even further, we can see another gorgeous building. Check out this beautiful 18th century building with a tower on top. So, this green building is Russia's first museum. It's called Kunstkamera. And um, it was founded by Peter the Great um, because, you know, right when he got on the Russian throne, um, he traveled to Europe and he learned a lot. He learned especially a lot about the culture of different countries. And he wanted to educate locals about those things. So um, he brought first from his trip to Holland a pair of wooden clogs and a loaf of bread. Then every time he visited another country, he brought some other exhibits and he placed them uh, in this museum, Kunstkamera. Um, but the most famous thing that he purchased for the Kunstkamera um, were not the items that were representatives of, of other countries' cultures, um, other than maybe a way to study biology and human anatomy. Because well, one day when he was in Holland, he purchased a collection that belonged to a Dutch doctor. Uh, and the collection was um, a collection of natural oddities. This doctor, he had um, fetuses that were in jars and formaldehyde. 
uh, with many different oddities. Like, for example, a very large head, or he had a pair of Siamese twins and things like this. So Peter the Great purchased this collection and brought it to St. Petersburg and placed it in the Kunstkamera. So um, this building ended up housing a very eclectic museum. On one hand, it had, um, yeah, you know, items from other countries that people could learn about different cultures from. On the other hand, it had this collection with really strange looking fetuses. And Peter the Great wanted to encourage everybody to learn. And uh, people were encar encouraged to come to the museum and um, learn about those things. And in order to encourage them, Peter the Great stated that everybody who comes to the museum, um, a woman would get a free cup of coffee and a man would get a shot of vodka. He would do, you know, anything to attract people to this museum. Well, um, <laughs> what ended up happening is that people would come into the museum, get their cup of coffee, shot of vodka, and just get right out of there. Because they believed that what Peter the Great was showing them uh, was a little bit um, not Christian. They believed he was an antichrist. He was trying to stir... Um, the peace here um and oftentimes uh, they also went straight to church from uh the Kunst camera museum uh needless to say uh, there were several attempts to burn this building um uh, but miraculously every time the building survived so uh, we still get to see this beautiful 18th century building and right now it houses the uh, museum of ethnographics so you still can come there and you can still see items that teach you about world cultures and in the very in the top tower they still have the original collection of the fetuses uh, that was collected by peter the great as well as some other items. For example, uh, Peter the Great, he had a bodyguard who was a French giant. And when this man died in his last will, he said that um, he was giving his skeleton and his heart to the Kunstkamera Museum. So right now, um, if you go in there, you can see a giant's heart and a giant's skeleton. So quite, um, quite an interesting place uh, to go and explore. And as you can see, we can find ourselves at the very end of the island. In the beginning, I showed you um, the island and I told you about the spit of uh, Basil's Island. So we are right here on the spit. Um, these two beautiful red columns um, in the 18th century used to be lighthouses. And this part of the island used to be the port. Um, so that's where ships would get docked um, in the 18th century. Right now, the lighthouses, um, they uh, only get lit for twi twice a year for the birthday of St. Petersburg, which is May 27th, and for Victory Day, which we celebrate on May 9th. So we are done with our first territory uh, that I wanted to show you. And I want to get back to this overview of the city. Uh, to give you the idea of what we just explored. So we were on this island. We were just here by the columns. This is the Kunstkamera building. Uh, this is Menshikov Palace that we saw. And the Modern Art Museum, Erarta, is sort of towards the back of the island. Another neighborhood that I really like and I want to show you today is in uh, this part of town. So it's you know, still close to downtown, but this is another residential area. Uh, so as we walk around there, again, you will be able to see lots of apartment buildings um, and local restaurants and, and things like that. So let me first bring you to a beautiful garden. And again, we will be talking about Peter the Great as we find ourselves in this garden. Uh, because the garden was originally arranged by Peter. In fact, over there, at the end of the garden, was the summer palace of Peter the Great. The idea and the reason why uh, Peter the Great arranged this garden here 
was to be almost like an outdoor assembly hall or outdoor ballroom uh, for his courtiers. So in the summertime, he liked to host receptions, not in his palace, but outdoors in this beautiful island. Um, outdoors in this beautiful island and for that reason he arranged um, the garden on the island so that um, people could dock their boats all around it and basically here people were supposed to educate themselves they would walk around the garden and they would see beautiful statues mostly of um, greek gods and goddesses you know all of that was really new for russians at that time um our country was not as open and um, locals did not know about Greek mythology as well. But Peter the Great understood that he was going to receive foreign ambassadors here. And by placing these statues in the main garden of the city, he would show these foreign ambassadors that, um, you know, Russians know this cultural code, you know. Um, he also placed beautiful fountains all around the garden and uh the fountains worked with water from a nearby little canal that is called the fountain river and peter the great you know when he planned to have these receptions um in the summer garden uh, he wanted to make sure that everybody obeys the new european rules of etiquette he even wrote them all down for his courtiers to obey for example, he said, um, one is not allowed to spit on the floor. Uh, one is not allowed uh, to eat with their hand. One is not allowed to swear. Uh, there were also rules about how to look and what to wear. One really famous fact about Peter the Great is that he, um, would, he wanted people to cut off their beards. And if he saw people with beards, he would just cut the beards off them all himself um he uh, introduced european dresses into the wardrobe of russian women so basically this garden was a way for people to um come and practice how to be europeans and if somebody didn't obey the rules peter the great had really harsh punishment um in one of the local museums we have this big goblet that is called Goblet of the Grand Eagle. It's basically, yeah, it's a goblet made of glass. And so Peter the Great, as a punishment, would fill that goblet with vodka and make uh, the people <laughs> um, drink the whole thing um, as a punishment. So normally people try to follow uh, Peter the Great rules. In this area, we can uh, see a couple other uh, beautiful sites. For example, um this gorgeous buildings uh, this is one of my most favorite buildings in saint petersburg and this is an art school um uh it's to be precise it's a school of applied art and uh this building was constructed here in the early um 20th century um they have amazing um, interiors inside as well um decorated with mosaics uh, they have uh, their own little art museum here and a separate museum of applied art, where they basically tell you the history of applied art um, in Russia throughout the centuries. And um, those of you who have watched Silver Skates and who plan to attend uh, the movie club meeting might recognize this building because this is where our main character was trying to um, get into university. That was supposed to be the place where she took her exam uh, and brought her, uh, her friend with her to pretend to be her husband. Anyway, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is also a residential part of town. You can see um, these are apartment buildings. And uh, here right in front of you is a very typical 19th century apartment building. Um, normally, um, a building like this would be an investment. So <clears throat> somebody rich would pay money to build something like this. And uh, then they would have apartments for rent in here. Normally facing the street, 
would be the apartments uh, that belonged to the richer tenants. Um, facing the courtyard would be the apartments for um, the less fortunate tenants. And sometimes um, people couldn't afford to rent even a whole apartment and people could rent uh, what they would say a corner in the apartment so they would have a screen would have a screen that separated their corner from the rest of the apartment so um, all of these 19th century apartment buildings have really uh, similar looking courtyards no normally there is a gate like this um, and inside uh, the walls are bare and not as nice looking as on the outside however Today, uh, when uh, 21st century people um, occupy these buildings, they want uh, sometimes to make their courtyard and the area where they live look nicer. And uh, in St. Petersburg, we have several really famous courtyards where, again, you wouldn't go during a regular guided tour of St. Petersburg. This is more of a hidden gem of our city. I'll show you one of those courtyards. Here it is right here. So this is known as the mosaic courtyard. You can see a beautiful place structure that is uh, decorated entirely with mosaic. And uh, if you look around, there is even more beautiful mosaic. So you can see the walls themselves are not really uh, decorated in any way. But it's the, uh, the people who live here uh, who made sure that this looks nice. It, um, one of the people who lives here is an artist, and he's the one who um, invested in it and designed this beautiful courtyard. And then the people who live here, you know, chipped in, made this look very beautiful. So oftentimes, um, not just the people who live here, but the guests of the city come and enjoy this beautiful courtyard. Another place in the area uh, that I wanted to show you is a church. So we are now inside um, a local church and you can see that the interior uh, looks quite grim. This is um, a Lutheran church of St. Anna, also known as Annenkirche. And um, this originally was a little Lutheran neighborhood. At the time of Catherine the Great, um, people from all over Europe came to St. Petersburg because they were architects, they were university professors, um, artists, and so on. And just little religious neighborhoods would be formed. And eventually Catherine the Great would grant them to build their own little church in the neighborhood. So this is how Annenkirche was built. Uh, but then, as you know, after the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Soviet Union officially became an atheist country. And a lot of churches were either completely destroyed or were, they were repurposed and other things uh, were housed in them. So this one uh, first was a movie theater. And then, um, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was just a private a real estate company that bought the church and they wanted to turn it into a nightclub. Uh, but this is when um, the locals uh, disagreed. They did not want a nightclub in the church right next to them. And there was actually um, a big court procedure. And as a result of which the company that bought it was not allowed to put the nightclub in here. Instead, um, they started renovating the church and um, just preparing it to be able to hold Lutheran services. And when the restoration was almost completed, unfortunately, uh, there was a fire in the church. But all the money <laughs> was spent on the restoration and uh, they weren't able um, to restore the church again right away. And so instead of just completely locking it down and abandoning it, they decided to turn it into this beautiful art space. So oftentimes art exhibitions are um, hosted here in Annenkirche. 
For example, um, some of you might have heard of the immersive Van Gogh in experience, and we had that in St. Petersburg several years ago. Um, and the next one that I heard that is coming after immersive Van Gogh is going to be the immersive Michelangelo experience. And so in St. Petersburg, when we had the immersive Michelangelo, it took place in this church and it was really cool. Um, I was able to actually see it for myself. Um, and when they had the Sistine Chapel ceilings projected onto the ceilings of this church, it was truly stunning. Um, but also it is still used as a church and um, every weekend they actually hold services in here. So this is a little hidden gem known to mainly just locals. <clears throat> and I'm just going to show you where this is kind of um, relative to the rest of the city. So um, you might recognize the Church on Spilled Blood the Kermitage Museum. And so this area is located um, right here. We just visited the church that is right about here. Um, but um, not only, uh, oh, I have a question in the chat. What is the church called? Yeah, the church is called Annenkirche. I'm going to put it in the chat. Oh. Yeah, um, uh, I just put it in the chat. Feel free to look into it. It's a really cool space. Um, and right now we are standing next to another beautiful building in this side of the city. Um, it used to be a mansion of a noble family um you know it's not just the apartment buildings that used to be here rich families got to live here too and again just like what happened to the local churches after the collapse of the soviet union um these mentioned uh, sorry these mentions were used as other things as well and um oftentimes in St. Petersburg, beautiful palaces got turned into palaces of wedding or wedding palaces. So in Russia, part of the wedding ceremony is um, going to the registry office, except for um, our registry offices, they are located in beautiful palaces like this one, for example. Um, I really wanted to show you this palace from the inside because I think this this is a really wonderful part of our Russian culture. You know, the fact that we get married in beautiful palaces. Um, people almost never get married in the church anymore or almost never bring um, the ceremony to them wherever they celebrate. Uh, they bring the guests with them to that palace. And so everybody watches them at the registry office, which is fun. I was looking for the views inside this building for a while. Um, I wanted to show you virtual views. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any. And so I made a choice <laughs> to show you instead pictures from my own wedding, which took place in this palace. <laughs> so um, I'll show you what the interior is um of this palace look like i'll tell you a little bit about the wedding ceremony plus you will see me in a wedding dress um so um this is the main hall and this is where uh the ceremony takes place and so as you can see it's not just a small intimate registry office we cram all of our guests <laughs> into this um, beautiful hall. And on the other side of the picture is uh, the official who officiates the wedding. Um, so it's just a government employee. You come there, she makes a speech. <laughs> um, since we are in St. Petersburg, um, it was really important for her to tell us that we now, you know, um, form a new cell of uh, the society in the city of St. Petersburg. And um, it's now our responsibility to keep it up. I see another question in the chat. Oh, uh, Elaine, I'm glad you like it. So this is the place, uh, as I said, where the ceremony takes place. 
Um, and this is the room where um, the newlyweds wait for the ceremony to happen. So as you can see, a photo shoot is a very important part of the Russian wedding. And this is what the, um, this is what the hall looks like. I just, I really, I did want to show you my wedding photos, but I also just wanted to show you how beautiful this is on the inside and how cool it is that they took these old palaces and they repurposed it so that the local people can actually use it. And can you believe that it costs virtually nothing to have your wedding in here? You pay a small fee of maybe about $10 and that is it. Of course, as you can imagine, uh, lots of people want to get married in such a palace and um, there, are, there is a long waiting list. And so, for example, if I wanted to get married in um, 2021, right? Um, for any date in 2021, I would only be able to start booking January 1st, 2021. Um, but January 1st is a state holiday. So really, it all starts maybe around January 12th. So the night uh, before January 12th, there is a huge line of people outside the wedding palace who want to get a spot for any dates <laughs> in uh, this year to get married in there. And really, um, in the most beautiful wedding palaces, they have weddings every half an hour or every 15 minutes. So it's like a big conveyor belt, really. So when we were getting married, um, we had to get a spot in January to get married in August. And there was a new wedding every half an hour in there. So of course, if you want to celebrate after, you have to go somewhere else. You can do it um, at the palace. There's really no space to do it. This is just for the ceremony. And this is the outside. Um, that I just showed you right here. Uh, finally, um, the last thing that I wanted to show you today is connected with my favorite place in St. Petersburg. As you already know, uh, my favorite place in St. Petersburg is the Hermitage. But today I decided to show you something in the Hermitage that I have never shown anybody ever before neither virtually nor in real life. So you definitely haven't seen that before. Uh, and before I show it to you, I see I, I see another question in the chat. Does the US have a consulate in St. Petersburg? Great question. So there used to be, um, there used to be a US consulate in St. Petersburg, um, but not anymore. Right now, we only have the embassy in Moscow. This is the only, um, representation of the US that we have in Russia. But for a while, the consulate was actually on this very street too, <laughs> just a little bit further down the street. Um, okay, um, so the part of the Hermitage that I wanted to show you today is known as the Winter Palace of Peter the Great. So we talked a lot about the history of the Hermitage and the history of the Winter Palace. And I always tell you that the palace was built for the daughter of Peter the Great, right? The gorgeous palace that we see with green walls and white details. But the thing is, it was built on the spot where her father's palace used to be. And so in the modern Hermitage Museum, they recreated the original Winter Palace of Peter the Great. And you can see some interesting details here. For example, what the facade looks like. And again, isn't this palace just so much more modest than everything else that we have seen? Peter the Great, he was a truly modest man and he likes to live in really small spaces. I also wanna draw your attention to this pavement right here. This is how they paved the streets in the 18th century St. Petersburg. You can see this like kind of chevron pattern here. Each of these little pieces of pavements is a triangle that is put in the ground with the angle down. 
and it makes this pavement, uh, pavement really, really durable because the angles are all down. And this is a recreation, uh, but there are parts of the city where we still have the same original 18th century pavement um, because of its amazing durability. I'm gonna bring you inside um, the palace so you can see some of the interiors uh, from the time of Peter the Great. Here, for example, is um, the so-called ternary. So this is where Peter the Great would do his woodworking. Um, he himself, when he went to Holland, he learned all different crafts, including woodworking, shipbuilding, even dentistry, uh, and things like that. So in his residences, he often had um, a place where he could do some work himself. And another interesting item in here, you can see a handprint um, of Peter the Great. He was a really tall man. He was 6.6 .6 feet tall. Um, and so he had really large hands. I think I have another question in the chat. The sleigh. <laughs> yes, yes, the, we saw the sleigh in the, in the courtyard. One other thing that Peter the Great brought to Russia from Europe, from Poland, were Delft tiles. He made them extremely popular um, in Russia at that time. In every noble residence, um, they had walls decorated with Delft tiles. And this is what you can also see um, on the wall in here. I'll show you just a couple more interiors. So now when you come to the Hermitage, you can actually see that it requires a separate ticket and it has a separate entrance, but still um, it is really cool and worth seeing. So where they recreated here, um, his palace, um, they have a lot of the original furniture uh, that belongs to Peter the Great and different items that he brought from his trips. But the highlights um, of the palace is um, <laughs> this thing. It's called the wax persona of Peter the Great. And if it looks to you like a wax figure, a modern wax figure, I have to say that this is not at all modern. This wax persona was made right after the death of Peter the Great. So um, a local sculptor came and created a death mask from his own face. And they immediately created this wax persona. Um, they used Peter the Great's real hair. And uh, this figure is wearing Peter the Great's real clothes. So you can get an idea of what Peter the Great looked like. And you can see him here at the Hermitage on the throne. I remember that I also wanted to bring you inside Minshikov Palace. As you remember, I showed it to you earlier um, from the outside. And I, I mentioned that this palace belonged to uh, you know, Peter the Great's close friend and the richest man in St. Petersburg in the early 18th century. So here we are now inside his palace. We are on the second floor. And um, I just want you to see how rich this palace is and it will illustrate just how much better Alexander Menshikov lived compared to Peter the Great. For example, on the walls here, you can see real Chinese silk because this would be a diplomatic gift that could be given to Peter the Great and his courtiers and Alexander Menshikov got himself some of it. Notice the beautiful painted walls. This is supposed to be an imitation of um, columns. And uh, the staircase railing is really interesting too. Um, Alexander Menshikov wanted to show respect to Peter the Great. And so it has the emblem of Peter the Great. You see P and P, they're crossing each other here in the railing. That means Petrus Primus, Peter the First, um, as this was the original title of Peter the Great before he was named the Great. Anyway, um, the palace had um, two halves, the male half and the female half. Right in front of you is the female half, but the male half is actually much more interesting. So 
I'll bring you there. So we can see uh, this is uh, the lobby or the secretary's room. Um, so this is where the secretary would normally be. Alexander Menshikov, some people believe, was um, illiterate. Eventually, he did learn to read and write because we know that him and Peter the Great were sending each other letters. Um, but he was a son of a stable keeper. And um, when he was a little boy, he was selling pies on the street. It's just that he ended up being one of Peter the Great's private servants. Um, and Peter the Great just appreciated his wit and um, eventually promoted him to um, one of his private servants. I told you earlier about Delft tiles um, that were brought to <laughs> Russia by Peter the Great. And you saw that even in Peter the Great's quarters, there was a little bit of tiles just on the bottom because Delft tiles, they were very expensive. But um, Alexander Menshikov, as I mentioned, he was quite a rich man. So he has Delft tiles on the walls and even on the ceiling. <laughs> it's a very unique interior. Um, finally, I want to show you this dining room in here too, with beautiful Delft tiles, um, uh, depictions of naval battles on the walls, and um, also um, this beautiful goblet in the shape of a ship. So during the feast, somebody would be drinking wine out of this beautiful object. Finally, there is a heater on the side here, um, also decorated with original Delft tiles. And I see a question. When someone marries in Russia, in this mar um, is this marriage accepted in the US or must they remarry in the US? That is a great question um, because this is exactly <laughs> what happened to me. Um, so I can talk, uh, I can give you the exact answer. The marriage is recognized in the US um, because when you are in Russia, you get a marriage certificate. It's in Russian, but you can have an authorized translation of it and use it in the US as well. Um, so yes, it is absolutely accepted. Um, Finally, the last room that I wanted to show you, as if <laughs> there was not enough Delft tiles and all the other interiors, this is the bedroom. And it also is, as you can see, uh, decorated with uh, beautiful Delft tiles. The bedroom uh, belonged to uh, Alexander Menshikov's sister. Her name was Varvara. And uh, in here you can see lots of beautiful original furniture and two heaters. And this was a bed heater. You could take it to bed with you. You could bring, um, you know, you can use the coals from uh, the heater. And there is one for your feet at the, um, at the bottom of the chair over here. Lots of beautiful original 18th century furniture as well. So right now, Minshikov Palace um, also is part of the Hermitage Museum. So they purchased it and inside the palace they placed uh, the Museum of 18th century culture so that uh, people can go in and see these beautiful original interiors. Um, okay, <laughs> uh, this is the last uh, thing that I wanted to show you today. Um, as I mentioned, I will talk a little bit about the upcoming movie club. You don't have to stay for this part if you're not interested in participating. If you are interested in participating, you're welcome to stay and listen to, um, to me explain what it's going to be. And also, if you have any questions about what you have seen today, you're still welcome to put it in the chat and I will also answer those questions. So if you open my email newsletters, you know that um, for a while I've been investigating whether um, anybody would be interested in doing a book or movie club. And um, you have voted, <laughs> some of you have voted that you are interested. And um, the first thing that you would like to discuss would be one of the newest Netflix movies, which is called Silver Skates. So you can really easily find it on Netflix. It's a romantic movie 
um, uh, that takes place in St. Petersburg in the year 1900. So right before the Russian Revolution, there is a class um, there is a class struggle. It's kind of like a Romeo and Juliet story. He's a poor boy and she's an aristocratic girl. But the cool thing about this movie also um, is that it was actually shot in St. Petersburg. Um, so we are going to um, not just have a discussion about the movie and, and just talk about our favorite parts or um, you'll be able to ask me any questions about the things that are happening in the movie from just the standpoint of Russian culture and history. But I'll also be able to show you uh, some of the places where the movie was created. And most of these either views or interiors, because I will be taking you both outdoors and indoors, they're also very unique. They are another way of seeing this unknown St. Petersburg and views that you haven't seen before. I'll show you one of those um, views just to give you an idea. Uh, those of you who have seen the movie might recognize this interior. Those of you who haven't seen the movie and maybe later you'll wanna see it, um, you'll see this interior in here. Um, this is where um, the main character's father works. This is the office of the police station. Um, and uh, it was shot in um, another mansion um, in St. Petersburg, um, a mansion that belonged to the Polovtsov family. And um, now it's not even a museum, so you can't enter and go on a guided tour. Uh, this is known as the architect's house. So this is more of a um, meeting place for the Guild of Architects in St. Petersburg. And they get to use this beautiful library. And so on, during the meeting for the um, movie club, I will be taking you to this building and showing you some interiors, as well as some other um, lesser known buildings in St. Petersburg. So this is just an example. I'm not going to show you anymore, <laughs> um, you know, because this is going to be part of the movie club. So if you are interested in signing up for it, and we will be meeting every month, but the first event will be next Wednesday. If you are interested in signing up for the first event, I'm going to share this Eventbrite link with you um, so that you can um, join us if you want. It's only $20 uh, to participate. Um, please, if you do participate, please do watch the movie beforehand because we won't be watching the movie during the meeting. We'll just be talking about what happens. If you end up joining, but without having watched the movie, you can still follow <laughs> what's going on because uh, I will be showing you again, like different parts in St. Petersburg, different beautiful views in St. Petersburg. Um, and I'll show you also some photos from the process of making the movie. I ended up seeing how it was made. <laughs> um, I was in St. Petersburg one summer and I saw one of the scenes. So I'm sharing this link in the chat. If you are interested in signing up for the first movie club meeting, the link is now in the chat. And I see some, um, I see some questions so I'm gonna answer. How do you subscribe to your newsletter? Um, I will share that link in the chat as well. So if you are not signed up to my newsletter, Maybe you found me just through Eventbrite. Um, I'm sharing the link in the chat for that as well. And I see some feedback in the chat. I'm so glad that you liked it. I see it was very interesting. I appreciate it. Um, and some more questions about the newsletter. Please feel free to sign up. The link is in the chat now. Um, when is the warm, dry season to tour St. Petersburg? Um, so if you prefer to stay warm and dry, um, I'd say your best bet would be May or July or August. I, in my experience, these are the three driest months. For some reason, June is not. It often rains a lot in June. Um, personally, my favorite time to visit St. Petersburg, I think, is May or September. 
because it is still nice and warm out, um, but the museums are not as crowded. The only thing you miss out on if you visit in May or September, you don't get to see the white nights season, which is what we have in late June, early July. So that's the time when it almost never gets dark. Uh, we have really, really long days and it's really beautiful. So that's the only thing you would miss out on if you visit in May or September. Otherwise, I really think it's the, the best time to visit. And hotels are much more affordable. Uh, Becky, I'm glad you recognized a lot of the sites when you watch the movie. Uh, that's awesome. What is, what is the name of the garden you showed us with the Greek sculptures? It's called the Summer Garden. Summer Garden. Okay, so far this was the last question I got in the chat. Um, I do want to give you a chance to ask more questions if you have any. If not, I am recording this, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning. So I will, be, um, I will be sharing the recording with everybody in the Monday newsletter. How to find out about all the extra features at the Hermitage? Exhibits that you need extra tickets. Is it on the Hermitage website? Yes. Um, so if you go to the Hermitage website, you will find um, all of the necessary information about how to get tickets. In general, you will see most of their stuff during the general visit. So the stuff that I normally show in the Hermitage highlight store, the state rooms, some of the private rooms of the royal family, the highlights of the art collection, all of that is included in the general admission um, ticket to the Hermitage. What is separate is normally the general headquarters building, which is where you see the impressionists and post-impressionists and so on. The golden diamond room, which is their jewelry um, galleries. Um, and things that are in other buildings. They have a lot of buildings as part of them. And you can also see it on their website, like Minshikov Palace. They have a wonderful um, storage facility in the outskirts of the city where you get to see um, a lot of the stuff that they are restoring, a lot of the private furniture of the royal family, their carriages, um, and a lot of really interesting stuff. But uh, again, you can, yeah, you can definitely see that on our website. All right. I think that was the last one. I'm not getting any more questions. Um, so I'm going to say thank you everybody again for joining me today. It's so lovely to see all of you again. I love being able to regularly see you and share my beautiful hometown with you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. I hope to see you again in the future, hopefully on Wednesday, but if not further in the future and, um, yeah, have a, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Okay, awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed to have an earlier session. <laughs> yeah, um, and this time works for me because this is the time now when, um, uh, you know, right now my husband is watching my baby. Sometimes it's my mother-in-law. This is a good time, but baby is uh, very calm. <laughs> so I will often have the, these tours on the weekend in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, uh, bye everybody. It was nice to see you.